Oh, it's my screen. My screen is already shared, isn't it? Let me um, let me bring up the presentation then. So can you, can you guys see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So thanks for um, uh, for invite to talk at your um, colloquium, Doug. Uh, this is my first talk at, at Fresno State. Um, hoping once this COVID thing settles down. Might be an opportunity to come in and um, join you guys uh, for real and see you guys face to face. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about um, the, the gravitational um, testing and approach. Um, um, so let me start by talking about um, the vacuum of space, uh, which, which actually isn't empty. It's it's actually uh, it's teeming with uh, with virtual particles. Um, so if you were to put a pair of electrically um, conducting para parallel plates in this vacuum, the the boundary conditions uh, caused by the plates will, will limit the allowed modes um, or frequencies of the virtual photons that can exist uh, between the plates. And outside the plates. Um, However, there are no such restrictions on the allowed modes um, of the virtual photons. And because there are more uh, virtual photons um, outside the plates than in between them, uh, this causes a pressure difference, which pushes the, the plates together. Um, and this force is called the, the Casimir effect, uh, named after um, Hendrik Casimir, who um, theoretically uh, discovered and um, in, uh, in, in 1948. Um, but uh, more um, specifically in, in quantum field theory, um, all the, the quantized uh, fields can be um, considered as a, as a set of uh, harmonic oscillators. And each harmonic oscillator has um, discrete energy levels given by um, E, E, N. So when you sum over all the possible modes of the vacuum, you get an infinite um, amount of energy for the vacuum state. Now, uh, this seems like a problem, but it's, it's argued that it's not the, the absolute energy value that um, is physically measurable, but it's the change or the difference in energy that is, that is, um, that is the uh, physically observable value. So if we were to take uh, away the infinite energy value between the plates with the larger infinite value of the vacuum outside the plates, um, we get a finite energy value. And to get the, the Casimir pressure, uh, we take the, the derivative of this energy uh, with, with respects to um, the plate suppression A, and you end up with this um, formula here for the uh, Casimir pressure, which um, uh, Hendrik Casimir came up with and, and now has been um, experimentally, experimentally verified um, quite a few times. Um, virtual photons, however, are not the only uh, virtual particles that contribute to the Casimir effect. In theory, all virtual particles um, should contribute to the, to the Casimir force. Um, however, particles which have mass act on, on a very short range and so their contributions are very small. Um, gravity, however, is massless and therefore um, long ranging. And so in this talk, um, I will derive um, a formula for the, the gravitational uh, Casimir effect. Um, but you might say gravity couples um, relatively weakly would matter. So you wouldn't expect its contribution to the Casimir um, force to be uh, very large. So, why would you want to bother to calculate the, the gravitonic contribution to the Casimir effect? Well, um, I'll give some reason um, or motivations uh, for, doing, um, for doing exactly this in the next section. I will then show you how to um, derive the, the general formula for the gravitational Casimir energy for real bodies. Um, this derivation will be the main result of this talk. I will then apply this formula to calculate the um, gravitational Casimir pressure for um, ordinary, ordinary materials, and then consider what happens when you use um, superconducting. Superconducting. 
Um, and give our time. Um, I also uh, want to derive the uh, non-relativistic non um, generalized Dirac Hamiltonian in a, in a gravitational wave background. And the reason I want to do this um, will be made clear during the talk. Okay, so <clears throat> the first motivation for uh, deriving the gravitational um, Casimir effect uh, for real bodies um, uh, rest purely on um, theoretical grounds. Um, normally, the, the gravitonic contribution to the Casimir effect is either ignored or um, perfectly reflecting idealized boundary conditions are used, um, particularly in um, cosmological um, brain world models. Um, there's nothing in between. So um, by deriving the gravitational Cassini effect for real bodies, um, we, we will fill this uh, theoretical gap. Um, also in deriving the, the gravitational Cassini effect, um, we will need to use both the laws of quantum mechanics um, and general relativity. And, and this forms another reason um, why we want to study um, the gravitational Cassini effects because um, interesting things um, happen at, at the interface of quantum mechanics and, um, and general relativity. Uh, one of the uh, well-known examples of this is Hawking radiation. Um, a lesser known um, uh, example is, is the Cal experiment. So the, the experiment is named after its three authors, um, Palela, Overhauser and Werner. In, in, in this experiment, um, a neutron beam is split up and sent along um, to two different parts. Um, in the Earth's gravitational field. The, the neutron beams are then recombined again and, and detectors um, were used to count the number of neutrons after the beams um, have been recombined. They, they vary at the height of the neutron beam um, by rotating the uh, the apparatus um, as, as, a, as a function of theta. Um, and this is what they found. Uh, the presence of the gravitational field caused a phase shift in the neutrons, which when um, recombined produce uh, an interference pattern. So this was one of the first experiment which directly measured a, a quantum mechanical uh, gravitational effect. Um, yeah, below here is, the, uh, is a photo of the actual um, apparatus. Uh, the neutron beam uh, theta were um, a series of um, silicon crystal plates. I've written here the um, Hamiltonian of the system. Um, omega is the uh, velocity of the um, rotating Earth. L is the angular momentum of the neutron. Um, with, with respect to the center of the Earth. Um, I've explicitly distinguished the um, inertial um, mass of the neutrons from this gravitational mass. Now, uh, it can be shown that the, the phase shift induced by the gravitational field can be expressed as a function of the gravitational inertial mass of the neutron. Um, K here is the um, reciprocal lattice vector of the crystal beam, beam splitter. T is the time of flight between A and B, and T prime is the time of flight between A and um, C in the interferometer. So you can see that the Cal experiment actually is also a test of the, um, the weak um, equivalence principle or WEP. So um, remember that, uh, that the weak equivalence principle, um, Webb says that the gravitational mass should equal the um, inertial mass. So in fact, um, um, the, the Cow experiment is actually the first type of Webb um, involving a um, quantum mechanical system. But um, why should we even think that Webb could be violating quantum systems. Well, uh, let's compare the action for a spinless classical particle and, and quantum particles in, in curved space time. In the classical action, um, the mass appears simply as a multi uh, factor. 
So what this means is that when you write out the classical equations of motion, the mass cancel, cancels out and um, it doesn't appear in, um, in the equations of motion. In comparison, um, in the quantum action, um, mass is not simply a multiplicative factor. So when you write out the equations of motion in this case, um, which is just the, the Klein-Gordon equation in curved space-time, mass plays a role. So in other words, how quantum particles behave in the gravitational field appears to depend on its mass. Now, the, the search for the violation of web is, is a serious business. Um, I found this chart which plots the results of web violation um, 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 in the classical and, and, and quantum systems. So these are experimental um, results. The classical tests are marked with um, the red arrows and um, Experiments involving at least one quantum mechanical test object um, are marked with the, um, the black arrow. Um, so an equivalent statement of WEP is that test particles will fall at the same rate uh, in, a, in a gravitational field, um, irrespective of their in internal structure uh, or mass. On, on the vertical axis is the um, EOVOS ratio. The EOVOS ratio measures the difference in acceleration of two test bodies. If WEP exactly holds, then this difference should be zero. The Cal experiment found uh, no, viol no violation of WEP, WEP up to an accuracy of about um, 10 to the minus three. Yeah. Um, later experiments have improved this to uh, an accuracy of about 10 to minus eight. Um, however, to detect any violation of WEP in quantum systems, we probably need to go to a uh, much higher accuracy. And there are proposals to do just this in, in space-bound experiments, uh, possibly over the next um, five, or, five or 10 years. So using this um, speculated um, violation of WEP, there have been um, many proposals of how you could uh, make use of it to create an effective enhance gravitational interaction with quantum systems. Um, here are just some papers that have um, proposed this. Um, I'll have a close look at one of these later. Um, now, if there exists a way to enhance uh, effective gravitational interactions, then the gravitational cast effect could be a measurable effect. And this forms a third and, and final reason uh, for calculating the, the gravitational cast effect, uh, effect for, for real bodies. Okay, so to derive the um, gravitational Casimir energy, um, I'll begin with the um, so-called gravito-electromagnetic um, formalism, formalism of the Einstein field equations, or, or GEM for short. Here, um, E and, and B are the components of the vial tensor, um, uh, which represents the, the gravitational waves. Um, e is, is called the gravitoelectric field component, and B is the gravitomagnetic field component. And, and J um, is, is like, a, like a, a matter cut. The, the gem formulation of the Einstein field equation very much resembles Maxwell's equations. And it is this analogy which um, we will make use of in um, guiding us to develop the gravitational uh, Casimir effect. Now, I want to calculate the energy of all the virtual gravitons in between the plates. So to do this, um, I sum up uh, the energies of, of all the allowed modes um, or frequencies of, of the virtual gravitons uh, between the plates. And by the symmetry of the, of the geometry of these parallel plates, the components of the allowed modes, which are, which are perpendicular, to the plates will be discrete. So I will sum over them. But the components of the allowed modes which are parallel to the plates remain continuous. So, so I'll need to integrate over them. Um, sigma here is the uh, surface area of the plates. Now, if we were to uh, naively uh, apply Stokes theorem 
um, to get the boundary conditions for the gravitational waves at the plate interface, you'll, you'll get an overdetermined problem because unlike the electromagnetic case where the fields are vectors, here, here the fields are rank two tensors. So instead we will use what's known as the smoothness principle, um, which says that um, it's only the traceless ten ten tangential components um, which are smooth across the interface. And if we do that, we get, we get these um, boundary conditions, uh, originally written down by Ingram in 1997. Here, um, delta means um, a change in a value across the interface. Um, chi is the gravitational um, susceptibility, well, which is analogous to the um, electric susceptibility. The uh, traceless, Tangential components of the gravitoelectric component of the field is given um, by this, and the uh, gravitomagnetic component um, is given down here. Alpha here gives the maximum amplitude of the plus polarization of gravitational wave, and beta um, gives the uh, maximum amplitude of the cross polarization of gravitation. Now, if I apply um, these boundary conditions uh, to these components of the gravitational waves, I'll get a, a set of um, simultaneous um, equations. So for example, if I apply the, um, the boundary conditions at the left interface, I would get this um, these two set of equations for, um, e from, um, from ETT. And this set of equations are from, uh, B, from BTT. Um, alpha represents the magnitude of the instance wave. Um, and it's alpha there. And alpha prime, the alpha double prime here um, is a reflected wave, and alpha prime is the um, transmitted wave. These two equations are for the right interface. And we can set up a similar set of equations for, um, for, for, uh, for beta as well. Um, so if we put um, this set of simultaneous equations um, in matrix form, th there exists a solution if the determinant of this matrix um, is zero. So this then allows us to do um, quite a clever thing. Uh, we can use the argument principle of complex analysis to find the sum of all the allowed modes. And, and the argument principle says that the sum of all the allowed modes that are zeros of delta um, are given by, by this equation. So now we can substitute this formula um, this formula into here um, to get the gravitonic energy in between the plates. This of course gives us um, an infinite value. To get a finite value, we need to take away the energy at infinite plate separation. So once we do this um, and integrate by parts, we get the um, gravitational uh, Casimir energy, uh, which I've written down there and have reproduced it. So um, let's have a close look at this. Um, we want to ask what, um, what, what, are, what are the physical meaning of this R plus and R, R cross terms? Well, if we take the two equations that satisfy the boundary conditions at, at one of the interface and solve for alpha, um, um, you get um, this equation here. Um, whose magnitude is exactly the magnitude of, of R plus. Now, if you remember, um, alpha double prime is the amplitude of the um, plus polarization of the reflected uh, gravitational wave, and alpha is the amplitude of the incident gravitational wave. But you can see that um, we can interpret R plus as the gravitational analog of the fractional uh, reflection coefficient for the plus polarization of the, of the gravitational wave. Cool. Um, 
Yeah, and similarly, we can do the same thing um, with beta to show that R cross is the um, threshold coefficient for the polarization of the, the gravitational wave. Now, I'm going to use the, the gravitational uh, Casimir formula that we've just arrived to find the gravitational Casimir pressure in ordinary material. But to do this, we need a value for the um, gravitational um, susceptibility chi. So to find a uh, value for chi, I will use the results of um, Peters who derived the formula for the uh, gravitational refractive index of, um, of thin films. So interestingly, Peters is, um, is actually, uh, when he did this work, was actually you know, at the University of Adelaide uh, in many decades before, before I joined. Um, so, so Peters derived his formula by considering the scattering of um, gravitational waves off individual particles in, in a free particle model. He sums over the combined scattering effects of all the particles to get the, the gravitational refractive index. Um, and, um, and the, the gravitational susceptibility is related to the gravitational refractive index derived by this relation. So if we um, plug into our formula um, N, we can get the, um, sorry, N into chi, and then chi into our formula, we, we can get the, um, the gravitonic contribution to um, the, the, the Casimir effect. Um, however, Casimir experiments usually don't directly measure the Casimir energy. Um, instead, they measure the, the Casimir pressure. So to find the Casimir pressure, we only need to take the, the derivative of the, the Casimir energy um, with, the, with respect to plate separation. Um, uh, once we do this and assume a, a typical density of um, uh, 10 to the 4 kilograms per meter cube, we can calculate the Casimir pressure. And um, we do find it to be very small on the order of um, 10 to the minus 21 um, nanopascals. Um, so I've calculated here the, uh, the Casimir pressure for a plate separation of, of about uh, of, of one micrometer, which is a typical distance used in, in Casimir experiments. Now, given that um, typical Casimir experiments um, at this distance can only detect pressures on the, on the order of um, nanopascals, this tiny pressure is well beyond what we can um, currently detect. Um, the reason for this is that uh, gravitational coupling is indeed very weak. To get a Casimir pressure that we can measure, we would need a density um, on the order of 10 to the 27 uh, kilograms per meter cube, um, which is um, completely not achievable, at least, at least terrestrially. Um, but, th but that was for um, ordinary material. Um, so I want to ask, uh, what would happen if we replaced it with um, a, a superconductor? Okay, so there's a paper written by um, Ray, Rachel, um, and we're still in there and Victor McNally, um, which proposed that um, superconductors could exhibit enhanced gravitational interactions. Um, I will first explain um, their argument, and Ray, if I say anything wrong, feel free to yell out. Um, then I'll provide um, a, a critique of it. So <clears throat> the argument for enhanced gravitational interaction in superconductors is based on the idea that um, WEP can be violated in quantum fluids. In particular, they argue that since the, the Cooper pairs of superconductors are delocalized particles, they cannot follow the same geodesic path as ordinary um, localized, localized particles such as the, the crystal ion cores of the superconductor. This means that when a, a gravitational wave hits the superconductor, the localized ion cores will, will uh, move or behave differently than the delocalized Cooper pairs. 
In particular, they argue that for gravitational waves whose frequencies are below that of the um, drift conducting BCS energy gap, this will not change the ground state of the Cooper pair, um, at least to first order. And because the ground states do not change, the momentum of the Cooper pairs do not change. In comparison, the ions will follow the geodesic path and hence um, uh, you'll get a polarization of superinducting plates because the, um, the Cooper pairs are negatively, negatively charged and the ion pairs are oppositely uh, charged, right? in other words, they're positively charged. So here's a diagram I took um, uh, from, from Ray's paper, which illustrates this. The, the gravitational wave has moved the positive ion, core, ion cores, um, whilst the negative Cooper pairs um, have not moved. Um, this separation of charge then creates an internal electric field. This um, internal electric field shows up in the Hamiltonian as um, QA, where Q is the electron charge and A is the um, electromagnetic vector potential. H is the gravitational vector potential. Then they use this Hamiltonian to find, to find the mass current. Now, because of the presence of the um, of the QA term, uh, the mass current is greatly enhanced. Um, this means that the mass conductivity, which is the, the gravitation analog of the electrical conductivity is also greatly enhanced. And with the electromagnetic case, the enhanced mass contact conductivity will mean that their gravitational uh, wave is reflected. The authors call this the um, heisenberg coulomb effect uh, because underlying this effect is the uncertainty principle which sets up the Coulomb force, uh, which effectively enhances the gravitational interaction. So, so one of the problems I have with this um, equation can, uh, we will, which problem can be seen in, in, this, in this equation um, here. Um, the, the other problem is with the actual Hamiltonian that was used, which I'll, I'll revisit later. But here the argues argue that uh, for gravitational waves with frequencies below the um, BCS um, energy gap, the ground states of the Cooper pairs will not change to first order and therefore its momentum um, will, um, will remain zero. And so that's why they've said it's um, to zero here and then that term disappears. I, I don't think this argument is, is quite right. Um, the reason um, I, I think it's not quite right is because um, the BCS energy gap is the energy required to break the Cooper pairs. This doesn't mean that the, the momentum of the Cooper pairs will not change, um, even if the frequency of the incident gravitational wave of the electromagnetic wave is below the energy gap. So in this equation, I don't think you can simply set um, the momentum uh, to zero. Instead, what I believe um, should happen is that the Cooper pairs move along with the iron cores in the presence of the gravitational wave. Now, whether the Cooper pairs move in exactly the same way as the iron core cores depends on whether the WEP is violated or not by the Cooper pairs. If the Cooper pairs do not violate the WEP, then they will move in exactly the same way as the ions do, and there'll be no internal electric field set up and no heisenberg coulomb effect, and no gravitational wave reflection. However, if there is a violation, the Cooper pairs will move differently from the ions in the presence of the gravitational wave, and an internal electric field will be set up, but of a lesser magnitude than if the Cooper pairs did not move at all, as, as um, the authors had um, written down. So what this means is that although A is, um, is not zero, it is probably uh, much smaller than um, what was originally um, proposed. In other words, if the Cooper pairs violate the WEP, then H effect is probably real, but the effect would be uh, much smaller. Uh, but nevertheless, using their argument, they were able to derive a gravitational reflection coefficient, which could be used to uh, falsify their theory, uh, which I've written um, here, where delta is the skin depth and um, D is the film thickness. Um, zeta is just the uh, imaginary frequency, um, i.e. The, the frequency times um, imaginary i. Um, so um, we can use the gravitational Casimir effect to test the, the, the um, Heisenberg-Coulomb conjecture. Here I've written down the electromagnetic um, 
fraction coefficient. Oops. Uh, oops. Wrong button. Um, okay, so this is the uh, reflection coefficient for the electromagnetic case, and lambda is the, um, the superconducting uh, coherence length. So using these coefficients and the um, the gravitational Casimir formula we derived um, earlier, and um, also the, the well-known Casimir pressure uh, for the electromagnetic, electromagnetic case, we can calculate the gravitonic and photonic contributions um, to the Casimir pressure, which is then on the next slide. Okay. So here I've done it for the um, for a superconductor um, uh, of lead, uh, made of lead of um, of two nanometer two nanometer thickness. Um, so if the HC effect is correct, um, as described in um, in, in, in the original paper, the gravitonic contribution will um, actually be in order of magnitude larger than the uh, conventional uh, photonic contribution. One could, in um, principle, then um, easily conduct a Kessel experiment with um, superconductors instead of um, ordinary um, material to test uh, for this. So, um, I mean, Personally, I don't think we'll find such a large effect as, as, I, as I stated. Um, if the HC effect is real, I, I think it will be uh, much smaller. But I do believe that the experiment should be conducted. Um, but perhaps um, after the theory has been um, developed a bit more uh, rigorously. Um, the reason for this is that firstly, the experiment is fairly easy to conduct, um, at least in principle. And secondly, if the HC effect is indeed found, um, even if it was smaller than, than, than what the authors um, originally claimed, it would have a very large impact on, on physics. Um, this, because this would indeed be a great, dis uh, a great discovery, um, as it would be the first evidence of uh, gravitons and um, the first evidence of violation of, of wet in, in quantum systems. Even experiments showed that um, above the um, superconducting temperature, the Casimir pressure could be explained by the photonic contribution alone, but below the superconducting temperature, you find an increase in the Casimir pressure that could not be explained by the photonic contribution alone. Um, even if it was only a little, um, and not necessarily on order magnitude, an order magnitude stronger, I think this would be good evidence for the HD effect. And if there was no effect, then this would also be um, a worthwhile outcome because it will place limits on the violation of WEP in, in quantum, quantum systems. Um, okay, so let me um, revisit um, the Hamilton chain that I, that, that I showed um, previously. So let me go back to slide. Uh, so this Hamiltonian um, was originally uh, used in a paper by DeWitt you know, in 1966, when he studied the behaviors of electrons in superconductors in, in the gravitational field. Uh, but in that paper, the gravitational field was static. And I'm not totally convinced that you can, um, it's an appropriate Hamiltonian to use for, for a gravitational wave background. So um, to get the correct Hamiltonian, um, you need to start with the generalized Dirac equation in, um, in the gravitational wave background, and then take the, the non-relativistic um, limit. Um, so this is what I did recently in, a, in another piece of work. And so this is what I want to um, um, briefly talk about um, in, in, this, in this final part of the talk. So I've written here the, um, the generalized Dirac equation in curved space time. Um, okay, so I understand that the audience here is primarily or, or a large part of them are undergraduates. So I'm not, I'm not sure you may have covered the Dirac equation yet. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Dirac equation, then you can think of it as 
the relativistic generalization of the Schrodinger equation. And, and one of the beautiful things about the Dirac equation is that um, simply by requiring that the equation satisfies um, Einstein's theory of special relativity, it necessarily leads to the concept of antiparticles. So, so the Dirac equation describes both the electron and the positron uh, relativistically. All right, so that's a Dirac equation. Um, I've also written, written down here the metric for a singularly polarized gravitational wave um, where F here uh, is a function which describes a wave propagating, for example, in the X direction. So using this, this metric, I can write down the, the Dirac equation um, in, the, in, a, in the familiar um, Schrodinger form and, and hence obtain a, a, a Hamiltonian. Here, um, gamma are the, the well-known um, Dirac uh, matrices. Okay, now there's a, um, a systematic way to get the non-relativistic limits um, with relative corrections um, from the Dirac equation um, known as the uh, foldy Varheesen transformation. Now the, um, the foldy Varheesen transformation um, or the FW transformation um, is an extremely useful uh, representation because it separates um, the lower and upper spinner components um, of the Dirac equation. So um, this is useful because in the non relative limit, um, we are not interested in the mixing of the lower and upper spinners. Because in the low energy regi regime, electrons don't uh, typically turn into positrons and, and vice versa. Um, furthermore, the terms in the representation are highly amenable to interpretations uh, in terms of analog applicants. So there are two types of FW transformation. Uh, one is called the standard uh, FW transformation. Uh, I think it's called standard because it came first. And the second is called the exact method. Um, both are unitary transformations, um, but they are not equivalent to each other. Um, so let me start by describing the standard um, F, FW transformation. Um, I'll first define the odd and um, even part of the Hamiltonian. The odd part contains the alpha Dirac matrix, which mixes the upper and lower spinner components. The even part um, only contains the, the beta Dirac matrix, which is a diagonal matrix, which therefore does not mix the upper and lower components. Um, so in O, the odd part of the component, uh, component um, I take away the beta components and in, and in the even part, I take away the, uh, the alpha components. So the standard um, FW transformation is a unitary transformation uh, given by ETIS, where S is uh, defined here. Um, so, um, if you apply the unitary transformation and then um, take um, a perda, um, um, so, so, so you, you apply the unitary transformation and then you take um, perda phase expansion. So that, that's the, um, the, the protocol used in the uh, FW transformation. Now, the first term here um, will give you um, something which is like a, approximately um, the negative of the um, odd component, which um, takes away the odd part of the Hamiltonian. But there will be higher, higher order terms, which in general contain even components as well. So once you get um, H prime, you've taken away, you know, um, a, a large part of, your, um, of the odd component, you need to re redo the, do the process to, to um, take away the odd components that's a high order. Um, so, so in other words, once you get H prime to a certain order of accuracy, you need, need to re repeat the process to get rid of the other even terms. Um, so in other words, H now becomes H prime, H prime becomes H double prime, and you repeat this, this iterative process until you are happy with the, your desired order of accuracy. Um, now I'm, I'm giving this a very uh, high level uh, review of, um, of uh, this whole process. Um, but I'll give you a reference to this later on in another.
So the, the other method is the exact um, FW transformation. Now the exact FW transformation only works when H um, anti-commutes with J, uh, uh, with J is defined here. So if your Dirac Hamiltonian has this property, then you can use the exact FW unitary transformation, um, which is uh, what's in here, uh, to transform the Hamiltonian into separate, um, even and odd components. Now this method is called exact because unlike the standard FW transformation, it, it doesn't involve a perturbative expansion. And so that's why it's called exact. But in practice, to calculate the, um, this H squared term, that's after you, you applied your transformation, you get this H squared term, you need to do a, a perturbative expanse a series anyway. But it's less onerous than the, the standard FW method. Um, and another major benefit of the exact, um, I mean, the, 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 the major benefit of the exact FW transformation is that it's much less tedious to calculate compared to the uh, approach of the standard FW transformation. A drawback, of course, is that it doesn't work for um, all, all Hamiltonians. Um, but luckily in our case, our Hamilton does satisfy the exact FW transformation condition. So you can use the exact FW transformation to derive a, um, a non erratic limit of the generalized Dirac equation in a gravitational wave background, which I have written down here. Um, and I mean, I've double checked this with the, uh, using the standard um, FW transformation, which you probably should always do um, anyway, because um, there has been sound, there, the exact FW transformation has, has been found in some pathological conditions to produce quite um, um, wrong results. But in this case, they produce the same results, so I'm quite confident this is the, the correct um, non erratic limits of the Dirac equation in a gravitational wave background. Um, okay. Now, the thing I want to point out is that um, even if we ignore the, the terms involving spin, um, which I've done here, I've taken that away all the spin terms, um, which, which are high order terms, the FW transformation shows that the Hamilton used um, in, in the uh, Mintz et al. paper um, is not the correct um, non erratic limit of the Dirac equation in a gravitational wave background. Um, so, um, as part of um, future development of a more theoretical now a rigorous treatment of the H-shaped injector, um, uh, this correct um, non relativistic um, limit of the correct factor should probably be used instead. Um, okay, and, and here's the reference for um, some of the more technical details of the, um, of the transformation. Um, and I think I'll end, I'll, end the, I'll end the talk there, Doug. Wait, what now? Oh, I think I'll end the talk there. <laughs> that way. I suppose there's any questions? Oh, okay. So that, yeah, that sorry, was, sorry. I, I said I'll, I'll end the talk there. <laughs> that, that, okay, hold on. So, uh, yeah. so uh, thanks a lot. Um, and yeah, so any, any questions? So I see Nathan. Um, so just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, ask away. Thank you. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, James, for the talk. I was excited to hear this talk. I've been studying that paper that this talk is based on for quite a number of years now. And um, I wanted to ask you about this Hamiltonian. Um, so I, I agree with you that there was an issue with DeWitt's Hamiltonian. Um, my understanding was that uh, it wasn't so much an issue with spin, uh, since he states in his paper that he's interested in scalar massive charged particles, because he's modeling the Cooper pairs as pairs of electrons, and hence uh, they have no spin. So I think that in his paper, he was uh, intentionally uh, leaving out the spin of the particles, which uh, I guess my question to you would be, uh, would you agree or disagree that the Cooper pairs in the superconductor could be modeled that way? Um, so I, the reason that I started off like, um, like from scratch was I wasn't sure what the final Hamiltonian should be. So I wanted to include um, spin from, from the beginning to make sure that we covered all, 
you know, the, the whole the bang, and then take the non-elastic limit and then and then remove spin instead of removing spin right from the beginning. And if you do that, um, you, you get the Hamiltonian that you see from the screen there where spin has been removed, but it's a different form from the one of uh, the with you. I see. I, I do have one other question, uh, if I may. I don't want to dominate though, if others are uh, itching to ask a question. It's a separate uh, question from the one I just asked about the gravitational formulation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about if you could go back a few slides to uh, the Hamiltonian that uh, Ray and Steve Minter, yes, uh, one for there. Um, so again, uh, obviously with Ray being my advisor and I studied uh, this paper uh, quite a bit. And uh, I wondered if you had thought about um, rederiving this work as well, since uh, you can probably tell there that it's a vector formulation. And I wondered if, um, if you're using that vial curvature tensor formulation, mm -hmm. if you wouldn't perhaps want to use a tensor formulation for the constituent equation, which would be associated with this Hamiltonian and, or I should say the analogous Hamiltonian and the analogous uh, supercurrent coupling to the gravitational waves as tensor waves. Any yeah. reason not to go that direction? No, that, 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 that's exactly what I was alluding to. So the, the Hamilton that I think you should start off with um, is indeed um, um, uh, a tensor. So, and then, yeah, starting from this, then um, you, yeah, you, then you can, you may follow it through um, this sort of argument. And then, um, you would probably get a different answer. And I think you've done some of that, but I think you did it without the um, electric field. Is that correct? Because I think your formalism was also a tensor, right? Yeah, the formulation I chose to go with was not the vial curvature tensor formulation because of my concern that the vial tensor is traceless and we are interested in coupling to matter. And so I went with the uh, gauge invariant linear GR formulation. Flanagan and Hughes seem to be the first to have come up with it and Poisson and Will published it in their textbook. But the point is that the bottom line of it is they show that the metric perturbation component that is associated with gravitational waves is the transverse traceless part of the metric perturbation. So like instead of that H vector that you have sitting in that supercurrent, it's an HIJ coupled to the, uh, yeah, I was noticing you have a TIJ. Is that the, the uh, space, yeah. spatial yeah, part of so the center? It, I mean, this is significantly different from this um, in the sense that the, the effect that the, um, the gravitational wave has is here as opposed to here. And, well, actually, no, it's actually very similar. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I was confused. So, yeah, so no, it's similar. So, so what this does is that, you can almost think of it as, um, so the way I like to think of this term is that um, it creates like an effective variance in the mass, um, which, okay, upon looking at this, it also does a similar thing. Um, alternatively, like normally when you have um, a gravitational uh, problem, the gravity potential sits in, in the V term. Um, but I mean, here it does all the, also the same thing. Um, but of course, the difference here is that it, it is a tensor, um, as, as, I mean, as you pointed out. This, this here is, is, is a vector. Is that the spatial part of the stress tensor you have there, the TIJ? The TIJ is the spatial part, yes. IJ. Of the stress tensor? Mm, mm. The TIJ, uh, no, no, TIJ is just the. Um, Back. Uh, I, uh, maybe I didn't define it. It's not this TIJ, it's not this T here. Oh, not so it's no, not no, 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 no. That, that TIJ, this TIJ is. I would be naughty and didn't write it down. Uh, no, that, that TIJ actually. Yeah, it's in my paper, but um, it comes, well, it's in that, it's in, 
newspaper. But this DIJ is, uh, represents the, the gravitational wave. Um, the, the, the metric, the DIJ is derived from the metric for the gravitational wave, which the, um, it comes to, yeah, from the gravitational wave metric. Okay, so I, I guess that's what I was really trying to get at was if it's the HIJ that would appear there, it might have made a little more sense to me only because then I could see how the gravitational wave is coupling to the supercurrent, uh, the PI and the PJ, and to the electromagnetic vector potential, the AI and the AJ. Yeah, yeah so this, this IJ was, was the, the vial components that you were talking about before. I see. Uh, Nathan, can I uh, interrupt for a second? You remember our correspondence with Freeman Dyson, where he suggested that the Hamiltonian, which we should use, is uh, T mu nu contracted uh, with uh, H mu nu, okay? And uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, James's Hamiltonian here, F here is uh, H mu nu, essentially, and T, I, T mu nu is reduced to T i j because we're con considering only uh, transverse traceless wave. So uh, the way I, I am interpreting uh, his result is that th this extra term, 2F T i j, is essentially Dyson's Hamiltonian uh, H mu nu, T mu nu contracted. I uh, would agree with that, Ray, if uh, the only thing is that uh, I think Dyson's uh, T i j in this context is the P i P j. That is the stress tensor piece. So I would, I would have expected it to contract with the H i j so that you have coupling of the gravitational wave with the stress tensor of the superconductor. This, 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 this TIJ is not the stress tensor of the superconductor. Right. Actually, the PIPJ, those two uh, terms together are making up the TIJ of the stress Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Now, 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 now it's clear. Yeah. yeah. So, so, what, so what, then I am confused. What is the meaning uh, physically of TIJ, James? So TIJ, um, yeah, unfortunately I didn't write it down, but it's it's simply just the um, it's the component of the gravitation. It's it's a metric which represents um, the components of the gravitational wave. Um, the closest thing on this this talk maybe relates to is potentially. Uh, the closest thing is, is to, to to these terms. Oh, 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 to the vial tensors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. That's oh that's, it's not actually that, but it's, we, we read the paper, it's, it's quite clear, but I didn't, I didn't write it down. Sorry. We'll have to look at the paper to understand it better. Um, my concern though, James, the reason why I personally did not go with the vial curvature tensor approach is because those uh, tensor fields that you have written on that slide right there do not naturally emerge in the Hamiltonian. Right. Um, they 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 come by the by the imposition of um, the of the metric that I use, which is this guy. So this thing here. And so F is your gravitational wave amplitude, true? Yes, correct. That's what I thought. And so the TIJ is related to the gravitational wave, even though you're using notation that makes it look like a stress tensor since T is traditionally used for the stress yeah, tensor. Yeah, it's not a stress tensor. Oh, I see. Okay, I, I was confused. Okay. That, that all makes sense. So I'm going to, I guess we could sort of think of the TIJ, as you said, as, metri as essentially like a metric component, the space-space yeah. metric component, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. That makes sense. I actually yeah. agree with you completely on your Hamiltonian and the fact that DeWitt's Hamiltonian would not correctly describe gravitational waves in the superconductor. And I can see now how yours did. You, you seem to have taken the more general approach of bringing in spin and then taking the limit when you take the spin back out, right? Yeah, just, just to be sure, just to be sure. I, I didn't want to do anything um, ad hoc. I wanted to start from something that I knew was correct and just move through. 
So here's a question for you, James. Um, what are you going to do about the constituent equation that you need? For example, Peters, I saw you referenced Peters for a normal conductor way back near the beginning of your talk. And so it seems that uh, if I understand right, yes, there, yes. So the constituent equation, which leads to his index of refraction, as you had mentioned, was for ordinary material. Have you thought about what to do for a superconductor to uh, ob obtain an analogous quantity? I, I don't think you can um, because the thing, so with the Heisenberg Kuhn's conjecture is that um, the, the special thing about that is that um, it assumes um, width violation, which um, the, the Peters uh, analysis does not do anything like that. It more or less just looks at it as um, classical particles um, floating around freely. So if we want to, um, uh, derive uh, the, 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 H, uh, the HG conjecture, we need to look at the idea that classical particles and quantum particles behave differently. Um, I mean, so what, what one approach that I've been looking at, I mean, I'm, I don't know how far it'll get, is to look at it from um, an information theoretic uh, perspective, where web violation is encapsulating the idea that um, we can, in the presence of a gravitational wave or, or field or, or, or any, any, any gravity, that we can extract more uh, mass information than um, if the gravitational field was not there. In, in, a, in a classical particle, which um, presumably doesn't violate WEP, then you should not be able to extract any more mass information. But in a quantum particle, um, using, for example, the klein gordian equation or Dirac equation, um, in the present gravitational uh, field, you should be able to extract more mass information. And that gives you um, a quantitative value for how much WEP is violated. Um, that's all well and good, but at the moment, I don't know how to translate that into the, um, the HC um, conjecture or effect. And I think to, to approach that, um, I mean, the way that you've been doing it, I think, is um, is promising, um, but I'm not exactly sure. Something along those lines where you just look at it more directly and not so abstractly, which I've sort of been trying to do just from looking from a different point of view, which hasn't got me very far. Um, yeah, the direction we took with, with Ray when I was working on the PhD at the time was to characterize what's happening with the Cooper pair density, much like you did and how uh, DeWitt originally did, but then also to characterize what's happening with the ionic lattice and then look at the difference between their two equations of motion to determine if there is a charge separation, which would be, I suppose you could describe as a WEP in the sense that you would expect classically the ionic lattice and the Cooper pairs to respond the same way to the gravitational wave, but in fact, they respond differently. Yeah, so th there's actually, um, we were talking about spin before, you know, um, spin, like even classically um, would cause, um, so if you have a, like a point particle and you had spin in it and you just use classical equations, it, it would actually violate um, uh, width. Um, so um, spin in quantum systems, by analogy, should also, um, Increase um, the violation of WEP, but the um, but the coupling of spin to gravitational fields is smaller. So I, I my guess is that the effects would be smaller, but we sh uh, probably at some point shouldn't rule it out just um, going forward. Um, um, yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, My, my concern is that with a superconductor, what the role of spin would be, because we know that the Cooper pairs are coupled in such a way as to make spin uh, no longer a relevant factor. So perhaps if you're looking at some other quantum system where spin does become relevant, maybe that would indeed be a mechanism to violate WEP and hence lead to some gravitational effect that wouldn't otherwise occur. But I can't quite see how that would happen in a superconductor. Again, maybe Ray or anybody else can comment on the nature of a superconductor and whether spin would play any role. 
Well, the uh, uh, spin in a, uh, a singlet superconductor where uh, the pairs of electrons are uh, anti-parallel in spin uh, and, and you're in a singlet state, clearly a spin drops out completely. So you're right. Uh, I, I don't see the role of spin in the non-relativistic limit that uh, applies to uh, singlet uh, <coughs> superconductors, but there are, as you know, triplet uh, superconductors as well, and uh, they're another story. But I have a related question for James on his Hamiltonian, which is the following. Is it possible to, uh, to see from your Hamiltonian the violation of Webb by inspection of your Foldy Boltheisen FW Hamiltonian? Uh, yes. So, um, so our paper is actually coming out soon, um, which um, uh, demonstrates uh, using this Hamiltonian that WEF um, is violated and it quantifies it using um, um, the Fisher information, as, as I just briefly mentioned before. So this Hamiltonian definitely leads to WEF violation. That's definitely true. It's just the magnitude of it. And the other question I have for you uh, is, have you thought of an experiment to test uh, uh, your predictions for the violations of web? Um, yeah, so in principle, so I mean, in principle, just by monitoring, so this is like a very, you know, very basic ideal case. If you look at a quantum particle and you monitor it, and then you look at the same quantum particle and you monitor it in a, in a gravitational wave. Um, and by monitoring, I mean like you measure its, um, its position. And from that, you can extract um, the, uh, the, the mass, fish information mass from it. You'll find that the fish information mass in the two cases are different. And so that quantifies um, the amounts of web violation there is because if they didn't violate WEP, then it doesn't matter whether there's gravity or not. The, the mass, the issue of mass should be exactly the same. So you can think of doing that in an experiment. But I, I so in the paper that, 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 that will come out soon, I, I plugged in like some real numbers. And the for a single particle, the number um, is uh, very small. You need a, you need a probability uh, resolution of detection of probability on the order of like 10 to the minus 20 or something like that. But that's for a single particle. But there are, I mean, there are ways to, um, to amplify these effects by looking at, um, at um, uh, more particles or, or using uh, quantum metrology. Um, but I haven't gone beyond just pointing um, like some signposts of, of how to, to measure um, these uh, web violation um, in a more sophisticated way. Well, I would encourage you to look at that because the um, one of the properties of superconductors is that you have Avogadro's number of coherent quantum coherent particles, which are uh, actually entangled particles that are not localizable. And that must have some uh, dramatic effect on, on uh, the weak equivalence principle uh, over what you would have on just a single particle. That's my intuition. Okay. okay. So I would encourage you to look at, uh, again, I think superconductors are, are a, a place to look for web. But the uh, other co related question is, the, uh, is the ex are the experiments at uh, Etwasch, that is the University of Washington in uh, Adelberg, uh, what is his name again? Uh, Nathan, can you remind me? Adelberg, or, uh, I, 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 his name escapes me for a minute, but he's the director uh, of uh, University of Washington uh, exper experiment on well, equivalence principle violations. And uh, I wonder if uh, that experiment would shine any light if you were to replace the classical 
um, materials that he uh, uh, it was he's using and his colleagues are using with uh, superconductors. Well, what's he set up? What's his experiment? Oh, his experiment is an extension of the early experiments of Ed, Ed, Ed Bush. Ed Bush was the um, uh, <coughs> test of the equivalence principle using torsion pendulums in uh, the um, early 20, 20th century, I believe. And <coughs> uh, Adelberger, yeah, that's his name. Adelberger, Eric Adelberger uh, has um, taken up, oh, I should mention, of course, uh, uh, Dickey. Uh, Bob Dickey did uh, a sequence of very important experiments refining the Ed, Ed, West, Ed Bush experiments in, at Princeton <clears throat> and improved it by using three masses instead of two uh, in the torsion pendulum. But uh, Eric Adelberger has uh, improved uh, on uh, Dickey's experiments to look for very tiny uh, um, uh, 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 violations of uh, the weak, uh, weak equivalence principle. And he hasn't found anything, of course. But the criticism I have of his experiment is that <coughs> he, he uh, is using completely classical matter. And I don't think that that's a place where uh, you should look for uh, uh, weak uh, equivalence principle violations. You should look for it in mm, quantum matter like superconductors. Did, so, um, did, did Michael Tobar do something in that space with superconductors? With, um, you know? Who? Sorry. Uh, Michael Tobar? Mark who? M Michael Tobar. Oh, Michael Tobar. Oh. Yeah, yes. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm just beginning to learn about his experiments. Frankly, I wish he had joined us. But uh, I know that his predecessor, David Blair, uh, was working on niobium superconducting Weber bars. And that uh, I, I don't know the relationship between David Blair and, and Michael Tobar, but I, I suspect that uh, Tobar is still uh, doing some experiments on superconducting uh, niobium. Um, uh, anyways, <clears throat> the, they, the, the uh, group in uh, University of Western Australia is doing work on uh, superconducted detectors of gravitational waves using Weber bars. That, that I know. Mm. However, I, I doubt that they are uh, uh, doing the Adelberger style experiments to directly uh, look for uh, a weak equivalence principle violations using torsion pendulum kinds of null experiments. And I think that's the place to look, frankly, because they are very, very, very sensitive ways to look for uh, equivalence principle violations. But as I said, the uh, University of Washington at Seattle has not been using superconductors at all in their experiments. So that's where I would uh, ask, I would look. But for uh, on the theoretical side, you need to mm, uh, look at this question of collective or quantum coherent effects involving many, many coherent uh, quantum particles like in a superconductor and how that could enhance the uh, very tiny weak equivalence principle effects. I suspect they will, but uh, there is a very fundamental prin matter of principle here, and that is in quantum mechanics, you have entangled states. Entangled states are fundamentally non-localizable states. And these non-localizable states are at the heart of any uh, violation of the equivalence principle. So you should think along those lines. Can I yeah. uh, make one quick comment and kind of with the question, which is uh, even though 
a violation of the weak equivalence principle is an interesting phenomenon in and of itself. What I'm curious about all along while listening to this is how do we get around the issue that at the end of the day, when we go to try to find the reflectivity from the superconductor, Einstein's equation always seems to kill the deal because of kappa being so small and mass densities being um, so small that they have to be um, extremely large to compensate for kappa in order to get some kind of a decent reflectivity and hence a gravitational Cassegrain effect. So I'm just curious if, if the WEP, if WEP is a mechanism, that would be wonderful, but how does it ultimately resolve the smallness of kappa as the main issue? That, that, I mean, that indeed is the, is the, is, is the hurdle. Yeah, the weak, weak coupling with gravity. Um, hmm. If you go to an earlier slide in your presentation, I think that's what you ran into with the normal conductors. And unfortunately, I ran into the same thing with superconductors. Uh, so when you back up to when you use Peter's result, yes, there. Interestingly, I arrived at a very similar number at the bottom there for a superconductor as well, unfortunately. So even yeah. though there's an enhancement it's, in, in, I was still led to the result that the mass density had to be huge. But in, in, in your analysis of superconductors, did you, um, did you incorporate um, web violation? It, it actually emerged naturally. By the way, I need to maybe ask you a quick question about that then. When you say web violation, if you have two different materials, say super, uh, Cooper pairs and ionic lattice, responding to the gravitational wave differently. Are you defining that as web violation? Yes. I mean, or would you consider that as an example of web violation, I should say? Mm -hmm. yeah. Then yes, yeah. then web violation did occur. I have to admit, I personally didn't view that as web violation because I thought that if you have intramolecular forces, whether quantum mechanical, like a superfluid or a super, uh, super current or more classical, like for instance, how we model a solid object, um, the fact that the object responds to a gravitational wave differently than free particles would, I didn't think is a violation of WEP, but I mean, that could be another no, topic. No, that, that, that's not a w w violation of WEP. So, um, so WEP is, um, is well defined classically. So for, classically, uh, for classical context, it refers to um, point particles um, behaving differently in, um, in the gravitational field than, yes, than yes. it's not. In that so, case, no, WEP did not come into play because all I really did is I put the Ginsburg-Landau free energy density in curved space-time to talk about the Cooper, the Cooper pairs and then the Debye model in curved space-time to talk about the ionic lattice and then modeled what each of them would do in response to the gravitational wave. The bottom line was that kappa still kills the deal and it's because you need a row that's huge like what you have there. And I can't see how WEP is going to save us from that. That's kind of the bottom line of what I was mainly concerned about because then no gravitational Casimir effect is going to be feasible until we resolve that issue. Can I interject something at this point? Uh, I think that the heart of the issue is this, that in WEP, we're talking about um, uh, equations of motion, uh, for example, of a uh, ion and, and of a, <clears throat> of a group of pair differing from each other and that that causes a charge separation effect uh, as an example of a uh, web because the difference in their motions uh, generates a field uh, namely uh, it generates uh, an electric field obviously due to the charge separation but it also can generate in principle a gravitational field and once you allow web to occur then the, the question is, okay, uh, equations of motion can be sources for gravitational fields that do not, do not involve Einstein's uh, kappa or coupling constant. That's the key point, I think. Yeah, so that, that, that's the underlying principle of, of the, uh, the heisenberg kuhl effect. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the ideal case is if we were able to read redo um, this, this HG conjecture um, more formally and see if we can get some sort of effect which is independent of um, kappa kappa being the, related to the gravitational constant. 
um, yeah, that, that, that's the key to it. Otherwise, as Nathan said, the, 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 the effect is going to be um, small, very small. So if you back up a slide to your uh, gravito electromagnetic equations, would that mean that you would abandon that formulation altogether as the foundation for the approach? Because of course that all assumes that sources are involved in the fields and there are supercurrents in the superconductor that are responsible for generating the gravitational waves. But if we're gonna uh, attempt to rely only on equation of motion, it would seem that those equations won't help us. And in fact, um, from my looking at this uh, gravito electromagnetic formulation using the vial curvature tensor, uh, you have to resort to the geodesic deviation equation. That's where these fields emerge. They don't appear in the geodesic equation of motion, which is what Ray's paper had that you had on the other slide where you had the supercurrent with the vectors in there. That actually is coming out of the geodesic equation of motion. Uh, yes, there. That's the geodesic equation of motion with electromagnetic coupling included ultimately. And then of course, cast into uh, a form that is consistent with London's constituent equation yeah. so that uh, we can describe a supercomputer. But if you use the vial curvature tensor, you have to use a geodesic deviation equation because those tensor fields don't appear in the, in the geodesic equation of motion. Mm. Um. Mm. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, and the reason ultimately is because that vial curvature tensor formulation doesn't rely on the metric perturbation, but rather on the vial curvature tensor split into a symmetric and anti-symmetric piece. So that, that's the reason why vial doesn't emerge. Anyone who looks at geodesic equation of motion knows that the vial curvature tensor doesn't appear in there. Uh, in other words, Riemann doesn't appear in there, but rather Christoffel symbols appear in there. I'm, I'm wondering the, so if you have, say you have um, uh, like the Dirac equation, and then um, like you put it on a, on a, on a curved space-time background, um, like I've shown like using information theory um, arguments that you will violate. You will violate web. So, um, so web comes out of that naturally. Um, so there, all you're using is just um, the the, um, the the space time metric. You don't need to use Einstein's field equations. That is true. Can I interrupt for a second and just uh, briefly describe what I think is at the heart of this problem? And that is, I, I return to the question of field equations versus equations of motion. Uh, normally, we don't think that equations of motion can ever generate, I, as I emphasize, generate uh, fields. But I recently have come across, I mean, this is elementary physics, but the Faraday disk generator, which is a spinning copper disk placed uh, between uh, horseshoe magnets with a strong magnetic field, which Faraday then uh, showed that if you have brushes that touch the rim of the uh, spinning copper disk and, and the center at the axle, then you generate uh, what he called uh, EMF, uh, electromotive force, okay? And that is the first example of a generator of electricity. It, of course, it's DC electricity, but it, it was a bona fide generator. Now, what is not well known, uh, not emphasized in the standard text is that associated with that EMF, there must be a generated electric field, okay? The electric field uh, has to be there to account for the uh, electromotive force. Okay, so this is an example where, um, and, and, oh, okay, and, and the standard uh, explanation of the Faraday uh, generator is to use the Lorentz force law, that is that the electrons in the copper uh, experience of 
a force which is proportional to the velocity of the electron crossed into the magnetic field B. And this is a, uh, a example of an equation of motion. And this equation of motion generates, I, I emphasize generates, an actual electric field. Okay, so here is an example from elementary physics of an uh, of equation of motion that actually leads to the generation of a, a, a field. And my, and my question, and this is uh, what I'm doing in my garage, I'm doing a, an experiment in my uh, garage to see if the electrons generate a gravitational field associated with the electric fields that are also generated. But uh, the, the, the more general question is this. <clears throat> we know from uh, Einstein's field equations that the field equations are the sources of gravitational fields and they are coupled via uh, Einstein's coupling constant. No question about that. And this is well verified. But is there a sort of backdoor effect whereby the equations of motion like uh, the Lorentz force law can lead to the generation of fields, bona fide fields like the electric and per 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 perhaps the gravitational field. Okay, so this is uh, very radical. And Ray, I think actually I can answer that question for you um, and maybe James and anyone else who can chime in and confirm or, or negate me. Um, what you're saying, if I understand, Ray, is the bottom line is if you take the Lorentz force and you set it equal to zero and you solve for the electric field, then you find that you get an electric field that's equal to V cross V, right? Mathematically. <clears throat> and, and that happens to be the same thing you get when you apply Faraday's law to that same loop. Like when we do introductory physics and we show students that you can arrive at motional EMF either by using Faraday's law or by using the Lorentz force set equal to zero and solve for the electric field. And then of course that means you have an EMF. You can in fact do the exact same thing in gravity. You start with the geodesic equation of motion. You set that equal to zero and then you solve for the electric like tensor field, which turns out to in fact have the velocity contracted with the magnetic like tensor field. And so you do in fact arrive at an inductive type result as what you just described. And by the way, you can get there in the same way as in ENM, where you can start with Faraday. As we know, Faraday comes out of the Bianchi identity applied to the electromagnetic strength tensor. Likewise, in GR, you can apply the Bianchi identity to the Riemann tensor and arrive at Faraday-like relationships and hence arrive at the same uh, conclusion, that back doorway as well. So all of it exists in gravity. The problem, of course, is that the weakness of these fields so they do mutually, what I'm trying to say is the bottom line is these fields do mutually induce each other. These, gravi the, these gravitational fields, the magnetic-like and electric-like, they mutually induce each other, but they're all weak is the, is the problem that we keep running into. Well, the uh, flaw in your argument, uh, Nathan, is that uh, <clears throat> you're uh, implicitly assuming that Einstein's kappa, that's his Einstein's coupling constant, is always involved. But as I said earlier, that the moment you have weak equivalence principle violations, that's no longer true. We need to look at that question. In other words, violations of the weak equivalence principle lead to Einstein, uh, no, let's put it different. It leads to, um, uh, non-Einstein, uh, that is non-kappa or kappa-free uh, uh, effects where fields, gravitational fields, are generated not via, via Einstein's coupling constant. And only, an in those, and only in those circumstances do I think that there's any hope of ever getting a, a sizable reflection of gravitational waves. That's my intuition. I, I have an idea. Um, maybe Doug, who I think has the email chain, perhaps we can uh, continue this conversation further because I realize we're probably nearing the end. 
um, maybe we could start an email chain among all of us and continue to elaborate on these and write out equations and, and try to uh, sort of hash it out in writing. Yeah, that, so that might be a good idea, especially since I got a text from my wife because uh, I, I promised. I, so I don't, I don't want to rush anyone. I, I just told her I'll, I'll be a little bit longer. Uh, but um, yeah, I think Nathan's idea is a good one. Um, so, but uh, let's see, are there any final questions uh, from anyone? So, and James, I want to say that was, that was a fantastic talk. I mean, it generated a lot of discussion. And so it looks like Bessel has a question. All right. Uh, thanks, Dirk. Uh, yes, this is really very interesting discussion. Uh, now, in the slide where you were showing that the gravitational effect should be an order of magnitude bigger than the photon effect. Uh, that was the calculations for the superconductor. Uh, but then for regular behavior, are you expecting that the gravitational would be much smaller or how would it compare to the photon? It would be uh, virtually zero. Zero? Yeah. Okay. And the, the other question I was wondering was, um, you know, the first examples of gravitational um, and confirmation of gravitational waves was the uh, pulsar that was observed uh, mm -hmm. in the 60s and then how it was losing uh, uh, I mean, the periodicity and their behavior. Now with the laser lunar ranging, you show that they were able to confirm that uh, weak equivalence is confirmed to a high accuracy I was wondering, are they able to check for gravitational waves in the, like uh, Earth's moon system in a similar way? Sorry, um, check for a gravitational wave in, in, what, in what system? In the Earth moon system, basically, because the Earth is deforming, the moon is kind of rotating around the Earth. And I mean, you would expect again that this system would gravi radiate gravitational waves. Um, and the question is that there will be, a, again, very small, but still, if lunar, lunar ranging is so kind of sensitive, can we see actually a, I mean, the emission of gravitational waves or losing energy in the system this way? Mm, well, I mean, I imagine the, the size of the gravitational wave gener generated by the Earth moon system is, would be just too small. The, 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 the pulsar, I think you're talking about the pulsar, B, the, B, the BC, BSR pulsar, they, they were massive uh, neutron stars orbiting each other. And even though we were quite far away from them, um, my guess is that the size uh, of the nature of those kinds of waves would be much larger than what we would get um, in an Earth-Moon system. Um, mm. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure. So, and I have to look, I was just thinking about that. And then my last question, um, since you, you start talking about the neutron stars. So there would be some kind of a super fluidity in neutron stars, which would be effectively a superconductive uh, mm -hmm. phase. Um, how is the situation then there with this uh, gravitational waves and that, 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 it's funny you should ask that question because um, Nathan was sent a paper which study exactly this to review, right, Nathan? Yes, and, that's right. And Nathan rejected it. Oh, no, 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 I didn't reject it. I just requested modifications, which they happily made, and, and it was published, so all is well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, vector, vector gravitational waves, and I just pointed out that gravitational waves should be tensor waves, and and uh, what the errors were there and everything was resolved. But yes, they were looking at neutron stars as mirrors for gravitational waves. I think they were almost looking at like a neutron star, like a cloud of neutron stars that could mm. then uh, refract or even reflect gravitational waves. No, oh, okay. Uh, but that, 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 were they having some estimates of how strong the effect would be, like the pressure in the star or I would, I can uh, happily send you the uh, paper. I, I think it's published now. And so I think I'm able to do that. Uh, okay. But um, the, the main thing is 
they start out with a gravitational analysis much like James has here. Um, and then from there, once they conclude that neutron star density is adequate, which by the way, if you see in James slide, um, that is on the order of neutron star density. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. that, that, that was the reason I was asking about it. <laughs> so in, yeah, and in astrophysical context, all of this formulation is much more usable than in our terrestrial where we're dealing with like uh, that M in that equation right there is the mass of an electron. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. <laughs> Wait, Nathan, so the, the, the thing is, the densities that James had were like 10 to the 27 kilograms per meter cube, right? Yeah. That's way higher than neutron star density. What is the neutron star density? I forgot. Something like below 10 to the 20 for sure, kilograms per meter cube. I mean, we, we can look it up quickly on, that's what, yeah, I can't even pull up my review response. Um, but what yeah. I so I, on the on Wikipedia, they have um, ba, 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 ba. it says neutron stars have an overall density of three point seven times ten to the seventeen to five point nine times ten to the seventeen. So yeah, oh yeah. So so the, and James on that slide, you had what ten to the minus twenty seven? Yeah, twenty seven. So like yeah. Yeah. Never mind then. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, the, the the takeaway though is that I mean, this is assuming ordinary ordinary matter, right? Oh and, yes, yes, yeah. that's right. That's you're right. Looking, you're looking for you're uh, you're looking for pressures that you can measure. So, like if you had a, a better if you had a better way of measuring pressures or you more sensitive, then you could uh, accept the lower row, but still. See, yeah, the row is, the density is pretty high. I mean, 10, 10 to the 27 is pretty much for the case when um, you get complete gravitational wave reflection. Um, so if you get only partial, like 10 to 7 will give you partial, but I mean, that may- Well, be actually, and that's a mass density, not an energy density, right? Mm. So, so I think what it is, what really ends up mattering is the rho C squared, not just the rho. And I think that the rho C squared for neutron stars matches up with the rho C squared that we had for um, the formulation we did in the superconductor uh, formulation. Um, I can, I'll have to go back and refresh my memory, but the point is that um, if you do this for superconductors and you look at the rho C squared that comes in, uh, see your index of refraction has rho there, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you do this for a superconductor, I think it ends up being the energy density that that plays a role. And oh, now I remember. There's an upper bound basically of rho c squared because obviously, since the you know relativistic speeds would be your upper bound. But the point is that I do remember for neutron stars, it it it's feasible. And so they proceeded with the paper. Remember, there's a paper by William Press about the upper bound on density due to the fact you're going to get a black hole if you go too high. That is um, true. <clears throat> that is true. Come to think of it, I probably should have checked that, that upper bound because yes, it's true. If you go too high, the mirror becomes its own black hole. And then obviously that's probably a deal breaker. Okay, so anyway, well, uh, James, uh, thanks. Actually, uh, we had a discussion that uh, went quite quite long, so I, I like Nathan's idea of uh, like maybe continuing this discussion at a more technical level further on. Um, actually, do you, do you mind, James, sending us the, your the slides of your talk or? I can do that. Okay. So uh, and with that, let's let me find where the re reaction thing is again. So um, so. Thank you. Th thanks again, uh, James. Thanks for waking up so early. Uh, it was a fantastic talk. And um, yeah, everyone have a good weekend. Uh, I guess, James, your weekend has already started. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.